Okay, thanks everybody for coming. I'm going to go ahead and get started, and if people wander in late, they can catch up. <clears throat> the, uh, I'm Bob McWright. I'm the director of the Salk Office of Technology Development. And um, <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about uh, patents. And unfortunately, unlike last time, I'm afraid I'm not going to have much in the way of pictures for you because patents uh, are essentially a world of words, although occasionally there are some, some drawings that go with them. Um, but we're going to talk about a lot of words today and how words are interpreted and uh, particularly how the words of patents can me mean that you have a strong patent or a weak patent and uh, things that you might do in your research or in the way that you approach your thinking about science that might lead you to get stronger patents uh, rather than weak ones and ultimately generate greater value for the Salk Institute and for your own personal income. The, uh, <clears throat> but I think we have to start at the very beginning and say, well, what is it that patents really do? Uh, patents give the patent owner the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale, selling, and importing into the United States the patented product or the patented method. Now, of course, if it's, uh, <clears throat> it's important to remember that a United States patent only covers the United States. And so uh, other countries have patents that would cover what you might do in those countries. Um, how do they do this? Uh, unfortunately, if someone is using your invention without your permission, there's no patent police office that you can call up and ask them to make them stop. Uh, a patent is essentially just a grant of rights. And I always think of it as kind of like a deed to land on the backside of the moon. You can't touch it. You can't go there. You can't see it. You can kind of picture it in your mind. You know it exists but it's just not something that you can do other than to describe it in words. Um, now, if someone is making, using, offering for sale, selling, or importing your patented article or method uh, without your permission, then they're called an infringer. And uh, the Association of University Technology Managers, which is the professional society for um, uh, University Tech Transfer people has a, has a band called the Infringers. It's kind of fun. Uh, but um, the only thing you can do with Infringers, other than go listen to their music, is to, uh, if you want to stop them from, from stepping on your patent rights, you've got to sue them. Uh, you can collect money damages when you sue them. And you can also get an injunction where the court grants an order saying that they can no longer sell that product or the CEO goes and spends some time in jail. Now, do you have to sue somebody to make money with patents? Well, fortunately not, since a patent infringement lawsuit will ordinarily cost somewhere between two and five million dollars in legal fees for each party. Uh, there's got to be an easier way to make money with patents. And fortunately, you can. There are lots of things you can do. One is you have, get a patent on something. Uh, uh, you can go and sell the patented product yourself. And the uh, we talked last time about Yankee ingenuity and the, uh, and the Industrial Revolution and a lot of the inventions that were made, uh, like the Eli Whitney cotton engine that revolutionized American commerce, were actually patents that were obtained by people who then went into business selling their patented article. You can give someone else permission to uh, make, use, offer for sale, in, uh, uh, sell, or make, use, offer for sale, sell or import your um, product uh, by giving them a license. In fact, you can give them a license uh, that only allows them to sell your product in California, and you can give somebody else a license to sell in uh, the rest of the country. Uh, if you have worldwide rights, you can grant somebody a license to sell in the United States, and other people a right to sell outside the United States. You can give people the right to sell only for particular purposes. So for example, you might have, if you have a, uh, a patent on a drug, you might license one company to sell veterinary drug products for treating animals, and you might license another company to make human drug products. Uh, you can sell your patent to somebody else, just like a piece of land. Uh, you can sell it uh, for a cash fee. Uh, the other thing you can do is you can refuse to do anything with it. You can refuse to license it to anybody. You can refuse to sell the product. 
And companies sometimes do this because they have a product that they already sell that is pretty good. It's not as good as the new invention, but it's still the best thing out there. And by having a patent, they basically stop anybody else from, from selling that better product and they protect the sales of their existing product line. So we're talking about patent value here. What is it that determines how valuable a patent is? Well, quite simply, um, the things that you might think. How much better is your patented product? How much more will people sell for your invention than they will sell for the closest alternative product? And if you have a good, if, assuming that you have a good market for your product, your product does have certain benefits that people are willing to pay for, then the question is, how well does your patent block other people from selling your product? How well does your patent cover your product? How well does your patent block others from doing something that is extremely similar? If you had a patent that only covered um, automobiles that were painted red, then other people could come along with orange ones and there wouldn't be anything you could do. Well, that wouldn't be a very good patent, now, would it? And then the question is, how well would your patent stand up to a challenge in court? And of course, that really has to do with how good a job your lawyers did and how good a job you did in describing your invention. As we will see, the scope of your patent and the, and the true test of what your patent is worth ends up being all about what the patent claims have to say. But we're going to come back to talking about those claims in a lot of detail. Well, first of all, how do you get a patent? Well, first you've got to make an invention or a discovery. That's kind of the hard part. And then you, have, you generally will have a lawyer file a patent application. Uh, if you make an invention uh, in your backyard, you come up with a new way of, uh, of digging up the dirt to plant your roses, uh, you might say, well, I'll just write a patent application myself. And there's a very nice little book called Patent It Yourself by a fellow by the name of Pressman, that's a pretty good guide to how to do that. And patent examiners will help you in that process. Uh, but most people will hire a lawyer to do it. Uh, patents are expensive. A patent application on a, something you might invent in your kitchen might cost you $5,000. A patent on something that might be invented at the Salk Institute might cost $20,000. Um, you file lots of forms with the Patent and Trademark Office. You have to tell the Patent and Trademark Office about all of the prior art that you know of. That is, all of the patents and printed publications more than one year before your patent filing date that may be material to your patentability of your invention. In a few years, the patent examiners will get around to reading it. Unfortunately, in biotech, it's getting to the point where it will take you about three years before anybody even reads your application. And I can almost guarantee you that if you your lawyer did a good job of writing the application, the first thing the examiner is going to do is they're going to reject your application. They're going to say you, you've, your patent is too broad, that it's not well enough supported by what you've actually invented and you're trying to claim something that is much bigger than what you actually have. And your lawyer then will, uh, will object to the examiner's comments, might make some slight changes in the patent application, and ultimately, uh, you'll get a notice of allowance, and then you get your patent issue. Now, to get a patent, you've got to convince the examiner of a number of important things. First of all, you've got to convince them that it's patentable subject matter. You've got to convince them that it's useful. You've got to convince them that it's novel, uh, that it would be non-obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art, that you have adequately described it in writing, that your disclosure would enable someone to carry out your invention, that you've described the best mode of carrying out the invention that you know of, and that your claims are of proper scope. Well, let's take a look. We'll take a look at some of these requirements in detail, but um, we'll talk first about patentable subject matter. In biotechnology, um, typical, kinds, typical kinds of subject matter we, we might have would be compositions of matter. Did I skip a slide? Oh, I did skip a slide. Patentable, patentable subject matter is any new and useful process, machine, manufacture, composition of matter, or improvement to any of those. And the rules on this are all found in, 
United States Code, which is laws that are passed by Congress in Title 35, Section 101. This is, uh, you would think that after, uh, well, the, this Section 101 has been in the patent law since 1953. You'd think it would be pretty well settled exactly what patent law subject matter is, but the Supreme Court is currently still considering another case, uh, the second case in the last two years on what's patentable and what's not. But generally, um, you can patent a process. So you might have a method of, of, uh, method of manufacturing aluminum cans. And the aluminum cans that are actually produced by that process look exactly like every other aluminum can. But maybe your process makes the cans cheaper or, or uh, makes them uh, more easier to manufacture. You need less, man, less manpower. You don't need big machines. Um, you can actually patent a, a method of doing business, which is the subject of a Supreme Court case uh, in Ray Bilski that was decided recently, uh, where the court said, yes, if you have a unique method of doing business, you can patent it. And we see lots of those kinds of patents in the whole e-commerce area, for example, and in also uh, the trading of stocks and bonds with electronic by computerized means. You can patent a new and useful machine. So you might have, there are lots of machines, of course, build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door. Um, and uh, also computers. When computer software inventions first came along back, uh, I guess this was back in the 80s, there was a huge debate between the patent office and the copyright office. And the patent office said, hey, computer software, that's writing, that goes to the copyright office. That's not an invention. And the copyright office said, oh, no, no, no. This computer software, that's functional. Functional things go to the patent office. And so uh, the patent office was refusing to, uh, to allow any kind of patents on computer software until a clever lawyer came up with a ploy. He said, well, Mr. Examiner, he said, I have this general purpose computer. It's a machine. It's clearly patentable. And I have a set of instructions that I feed to this machine. And it now turns it into a special purpose computer. And I want to patent that special purpose computer. And that computer, of course, is a machine. So it's patentable subject matter. And so today, uh, of course, you can patent computer software, provided that you put it in the context of a, of a special purpose machine. Uh, manufacture simply means an article of manufacture. Toys, cell phones, memory chips, anything that can be manufactured can pretty much be patented. A composition of matter, as we'll see in more detail later, uh, is essentially a substance. Um, new drugs, for example. When uh, Selman Waxman discovered that the bacterium Streptomyces secreted something that killed other bacteria, he isolated the compound streptomycin, and uh, his patent was on substantially purified streptomycin, which didn't exist in nature. It only existed in nature in minute amounts. But when concentrated, it could be used as a drug that ultimately cured tuberculosis. And you can also get a patent on any improvement to any of these kinds of things. So you may not have the, the grand idea, but you may have uh, a, a somewhat better concept of the grand idea, and you can get a patent on that as well. Now, in biotechnology, the composite, which pretty much is most of what we see at the Salk Institute, uh, we do, we're looking at compositions of matter. Certainly, those are the most powerful patents, as we'll see. Uh, drugs, small molecule drugs, uh, very valuable, as we know. Uh, Amongst uh, university inventions, I would say small molecule drugs have been the most profitable. Um, you, you have various uh, antibodies and other ways of controlling the expression of genes uh, that can also be compositions of matter. We also have uh, cell lines. In uh, Chakrabarty v. Diamond in 1980, the US Supreme Court determined that living things are patentable. Um, and the fact that they are living does not render them any less patentable if they meet all of the other requirements of the patent law. There is, however, one kind of, uh, uh, of living thing that is not patentable, 
and that is human beings, because the 13th Amendment to the Constitution prohibits slavery. Isolated proteins and nucleic acids are also compositions of matter. And then in biotech, we also see lots of methods. Uh, screening, method of screening for drugs is something we see many such inventions. Methods of making induced pluripotent stem cells. Methods of carrying out gene therapy and methods of treatment or for the treatment or prevention of disease. Um, so we now have patentable subject matter. What else do we have to prove to the examiner? Well, we have to prove that the invention has utility. Now, this is usually a pretty easy one to overcome. So if you have a patent on a new, uh, on a new mousetrap, it's clear that there's a use for it. You can catch mice. Um, perpetual motion machines have been a constant plague of the patent office, and the utility requirement to some degree helps clear those out. Uh, although very often they're described as toys. <laughs> the, um, uh, but there are many other cases where uh, it hasn't been so clear what the use was intended for the uh, claimed invention. In a very famous university case, Brenner v. Manson, Professor Brenner came up with a whole group of new steroid compounds, uh, quite an extensive array of such compounds. And he said that many of these Many steroid compounds uh, otherwise known had been shown to be effective in treating uh, cancer. And so he said that uh, uh, he thought that his new steroid compounds would be very useful in uh, screening for cancer therapy dr uh, drugs, using some of them as cancer drugs. But he didn't actually suggest that any of them were. He had no way of knowing which ones would be any good. He just said, well, there's a lot here to choose from, and it'd be easy enough to go figure that out. Well, the, uh, uh, the court said, that's just not good enough. Because basically what he was saying was, I've invented these compounds, and they would be really good for studying themselves. And uh, that's not quite good enough, uh, the court said, to meet the utility requirement. Another one that has a lot of, uh, got a lot of uh, notoriety in biotechnology was the efforts by the National Institutes of Health, amongst others, to patent many, many express sequence tags, bits of DNA that nobody really knew exactly what they were good for. Um, but they knew that they were parts of the human genome, and they thought, well, we should snap these up and patent them. And um, in fact, NIH uh, was probably the biggest purveyor of patents on ESTs. And they started to get some, uh, some rejections on utility grounds. And then ultimately, it became a real public policy question as to whether somebody should own the hum human genome without having any particular, shown any particular value in owning those bits and pieces. And NIH gave up on all of its pat patents. Now, in the early days of biotechnology, human therapy claims were, uh, you know, you very often you're saying, you know, I, I've got a way of treating human disease. Well, in the early days, the examiner said, well, if you're going to say that this can be used to treat, uh, can treat uh, arthritis in humans, then where's your human data? And I, the biotech companies would say, well, I don't have any human data because I can't afford it. I've got, I've got to raise tens of millions of dollars to be able to do human trials. And how am I going to raise money if I can't get a patent? I said, well, you can't have a patent until you get the, uh, until you have the human data. So it became kind of a catch-22 that really served as a roadblock in biotechnology. Uh, the patent commissioner at the time ultimately stepped in and said, this is nonsense. I said, we don't want to, we don't want to completely stifle the biotechnology industry by expecting them uh, to perform something they can't do. So he set down a new rule and said, what you've got to do is you've got to state a plausible use. So if you've got some animal data that suggests that this uh, drug could be used, can, is successful in uh, treating arthritis in a certain animal models, then, uh, and you say, you know, that you believe that this would correlate with a similar utility in humans, that unless the examiner has find something in the literature that suggests that that would, would be 
uh, not be the case, then they have to accept that as a plausible utility. Uh, of course, if the examiner finds something in the literature that suggests otherwise, then they could put you to, to further proofs. The third thing you've got to convince the patent examiner is that your invention is novel. Um, novelty basically means it was never invented before. And more specifically, it was never known, used, patented, or published before you invented it. Uh, so the first paragraph you see here, I've got another reference to the United States Code, this time section 102. 102A is the first bullet, must not have been known, used, or patented, or published before you invented it. And then the second bullet is 102B, must not have been patented, published, or in public use or on sale more than one year before your patent application. And this is the paragraph that describes what we mean when we say prior art. So prior art is any printed publication or patent that's in existence more than one year before the day you apply for a patent on your invention. Um, and um, it also can't be in public use or on sale uh, before that time. And uh, then there's this, uh, the issue of so-called hidden prior art, where if somebody, you file a patent application, somebody else filed a patent application that you can't see because it's still confidential. They don't get published for 18 months. And they have a patent application that ultimately issues as a patent, even though the patent issues two years after you filed your application, it still can stop you from getting a patent because what they described in their patent application was prior to um, when you filed your patent application. So even though, yes, issued patents can be prior art that can stop you from being able to prove novelty, um, but uh, also some of these applications that are not yet patents can also under this rule. Uh, there's one exception to the novelty uh, uh, requirement, and that's called lost art. And uh, there's one very famous case where there was a, uh, a fellow who had a very profitable patent on, on safes for storing money and jewelry. And uh, one of his competitors went to a landfill and dug down in the landfill, and I don't know how they had any idea this was there, dug down in the landfill and they found a safe that had been buried for 40 years that had the exact same mechanism as as was patented by this fellow. <clears throat> and um, ultimately, it, he sued saying, aha, here's some prior art. This was already, uh, already uh, was uh, known and used before he invented it. And the court said, no, that's not gonna work. That's just, that art has been lost. And if you have to go to such extraordinary measures to dig it up again, and we're not going to consider that to be prior art, but it's a very narrow exception. Um, you notice one of the things that can block you from getting a patent is if your invention was in public use more than a year before your invention. And this is probably one of the most famous cases in all of patent law. The um, Egbert v. Lippmann. Egbert invented corset stays, you know, based springs that would go into a woman's uh, corset. And uh, traditionally those were made out of bone and he made some out of metal that uh, were more comfortable to wear and lasted longer. And it turned out he had given a set to a young lady who'd used them for several years until they wore out. And then she, uh, she uh, replaced them with her old bone ones. Well, the court said, that uh, that was still public use, even though nobody who saw her ever saw her corset, let alone saw what, what kind of stays or springs were in her corset, that uh, public use does not mean open to public display. Public me use simply means that it was being used for its intended purpose for more than a year. And here they said that Egbert just sat on his rights too long and that uh, he wasn't going to get his patent. 
the fourth thing you've got to explain to convince the examiner is that your invention is non-obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art. And that is, can a person who, who would be qualified to solve a problem such as your invention solves, uh, would, they be would they be able to combine two or more prior art references to arrive at your invention? And this is a standard that was really set down by Thomas Jefferson when he turned out to be, wound up being the first patent examiner in his duties as Secretary of State under George Washington. And he said he didn't think that mere combinations of old elements uh, were, were important enough or creative enough uh, to justify the public burden of the patent monopoly. He really felt that any kind of monopoly was bad and the patent monopoly should be limited to where it can actually have an important role in stimulating uh, and encouraging people to be innovative. Um, the differences between non-obviousness and utility is really a fairly simple one. The question about utility is, is there a single reference, a single printed publication or patent that if you read that, you go, oh, there's the invention. If so, then you, you lack novelty in your invention. But if there are two references or more, where you say, well, you read this reference, you read this reference, they go, oh, anybody who read those two, they would, they would see my invention right away. Uh, then that's obviousness. <clears throat> now, there are... Uh, in the Supreme, Supreme Court recently took up an obviousness case and in KSRB Teleflex. And the question, the invention was, you've probably seen cars where you can move the position of the gas pedal depending on how tall you are. Well, there's a very complicated mechanism for doing that. And when these were originally designed, there was essentially a cable. When you stepped on the gas, it pulled on a cable which pulled the throttle. Well, when electronic ignitions came along, it was no longer pulling on a cable mechanically. It was turning an electronic sensor. And the question was, well, if you're going to take the same adjustable gas pedal, and instead of using a cable, you're now going to put an electronic sensor on there, where would you put the sensor? And uh, the Supreme Court said, well, there was really only about five places on that mechanism that you could put the sensor. And any one of ordinary skill in the art could have tried all five and decided which one was the best. And in fact, the one that was the best was one where the wire wouldn't constantly, the wire that went to the sensor wouldn't constantly be wiggled, which could lead it to wear out. And um, so even today, we have the Supreme Court really looking very closely at cases of uh, of obviousness, and obviousness tends to be the big battleground in your efforts to convince the examiner that your invention is patentable. Now, there are some things that are good indicators that your invention is not obvious. One is, you got unexpected results. And you mixed two colorless liquids and they turned purple. A plus B equals Q. Well, you didn't expect that. Uh, unpredictable success. Well, you said, well, I think that this, this uh, new chemical I've come up with, I think it could be good for uh, treating diabetes. Well, you might think so, but there might be no objective reason to think so. It's, un it's unpredictable that it would work. And so when it, if it turns out it does work, then that's a good indication that it's not obvious. There was a very famous Supreme Court case called Graham v. John Deere where they laid out a number of so-called secondary indicators of non-obviousness, which some of which are kind of fun. If you have solved a long-felt unsatisfied need, then perhaps your invention wasn't obvious because if it was the combination of two or three old references, and other people had been trying to solve that problem and they had never realized they could combine those, well, then maybe it just wasn't obvious to do it. One of my favorites, and I've seen this happen uh, in one really neat case, scientific criticism followed by scientific accolade. 
an inventor at the University of Virginia who had found that you could remove bloodborne pathogens by attaching them with antibodies to the red blood cells and uh, at a particular site called CR1. And everybody, in, everybody who knew, who was anybody in the complement uh, chemistry area said, oh, you can't attach anything to CR1, you kill the red cells. Uh, well, it turned out they were wrong. And uh, that evidence was enough to convince the examiner to allow our patent. Commercial success. Sometimes uh, the fact that uh, you made certain combinations of elements and, uh, and came up with a solution that otherwise might seem simple and turns out to be hugely commercially successful again suggests, well, gee, if it, was, if it was so easy to arrive at this invention, then why did it turn out to be so, so valuable? And why, if it was so valuable, why didn't somebody do that before? And also the failure of others more generally to try to solve the problem that you have solved. Now we're going to get into uh, uh, an area where there you could write, you, I could talk for 12 hours on these issues, written description enablement and best mode. Um, the patent laws, in section 112, say you must give a written description of the invention and the manner and process of making and using it in such full, clear, and concise and exact terms as to enable any person skilled in the art to make and use same. The enable any person skilled in the art to make and use same is the enablement requirement. And you must, your patent application must describe the invention such that one of ordinary skill in the art could make and use the invention without undue experimentation. And that's usually where the big question mark comes. How easy would it be to, um, uh, to actually make your invention? How many experiments would you have to do? Some of the early patents you know, on uh, monoclonal antibodies the question was, well, you would have to sort through millions of hybridomas to find one that actually made that proper monoclonal. And the court said, well, you know what? Maybe they would have to, but it was predictable that they would have to do that, and it was also predictable that they would find it. And so even though it required uh, many experiments, uh, it wasn't undue experimentation because it didn't require them to use a lot of creative ingenuity to figure it out. The uh, written description requirement uh, actually uh, has gotten a lot of attention by the courts in recent years. You basically, uh, there's some recent cases that suggest that if you mention particular chemicals in your patent application, that you've got to mention them with some particularity. You can't just say, oh, this kind of group of chemicals would also work. You've got to spell it out. Again, it comes down to making it in full, clear, and concise terms. And then you have to describe the best mode of carrying out the invention that you know of at the, at the time you file your patent application. So if you write a patent, you, you file a patent application, and you say, but you know what? There's this one little trick that I really don't want to tell everybody about, so I'll just hold that back. That will destroy patentability. You've got to let that put that little trick in there. Now, you file your patent application, and then three months later, you come up with a great new, a new trick, a new, a new improvement on it, a new best mode. You don't have to tell anybody about that one. It's only at the time you file your application. And then we're going to get to the heart of the matter, and this is what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about, and that is the proper scope of the claims, because this ultimately is what you need to convince the examiner because at the end of the day, it's the claims that ultimately determine how valuable your patent is going to be. Now, the claims are a series of very stylized statements at the end of your description of your invention that describe what we call the meets and bounds of the invention. They're very much like uh, if you ever read the deed to your house, uh, you'll see that it will talk about it will describe in words where the property lines are. And um, it may, may talk about plot and map numbers and things like that. So again, it's describing in words something that you can't, you're not actually 
looking at at the time. Um, another good uh, uh, analogy would be the, with the claims people made to uh, parcels of land uh, to ranch or farm in the Wild West back when we had basically you could go just claim yourself a piece of land. Well, you claimed it by describing it in words in a document that you went down and you filed with the county clerk as your claim. And the wording is very specific uh, in these claims. And this is a lot of uh, what the lawyer's skill is going to go into. Um, but as you'll see, uh, there's some interesting things about how these claims work. And knowing something about how claims are written and what they mean and how they define the scope of the invention helps you to understand how to know how valuable the invention you're making is and what you might do to allow yourself to make better claims and get more value in your patent. So we have, uh, we'll talk about 10 different kinds of plant claims. Independent, dependent, mechanical, chemical, marcouche, formulation, method of manufacture, method of treatment, product by process, and gypsum. Now, so here's a, an example of an independent claim. Independent claim simply means it does not refer to any other claims. It stands on its own. Uh, can anybody tell me what this invention is? When you figure it out, just uh, holler it out. You know, somebody got it. The wheel. All right? You've got one or more flat round disks. Okay? So you have a flat round disk balanced on edge, having a perpendicular central opening, and a rod sticking through the opening upon which heavy objects can be placed and can be moved by pushing the rounded edge of the disk along the ground. And uh, this is... This is kind of how um, everybody see the picture in their mind. And this is how claims, claims are written. You say, well, that, why wouldn't you just say, well, it's a wheel, or you show a drawing. Well, there would be drawings in the, in the application. And there may also be, um, there may also be um, uh, some description of what a quote unquote wheel might be, but you know, there are a few limitations to this claim. Now look at this. It has to be a flat round disc. How about if it's a ball with a hole through the middle? That could also serve as a wheel. You could also put heavy things on the axle and push it down the road. But would that be covered by this claim? I don't think so. So maybe they should have thought about that flat rounded disc. Maybe it should have just been rounded discs. Um, the rod. Well, it has to be a rod. How about if it's a, uh, how about if it's a, uh, a piece of wood, if it's something that's uh, rectangular? Would that be a rod? Well, these are questions of claim interpretation, and this is what a court would have to decide. So you're Og the caveman, and this is your patent claim, and you're selling your wheels like crazy, and along comes somebody with a square axle or a, uh, or a rectangular axle, and you say, why, that's an infringement. Then the, they would say, well, what's this word rod mean? They would go back and read the patent application and say, well, in your patent application, how did you use the word rod? Did you describe rod as simply a, a cylindrical device? Or did you say it was just something that was long? <laughs> how did you describe it? Did you, did you mention that a rod might be squared or it might be round. And so again, this goes back to the written description and its interplay with the, the, uh, the claims. Okay, so now here's a, a few dependent claims. So claim number two, the load moving device of claim one, wherein said hobby, heavy objects are attached to said rod. So now you're taking your heavy objects and you're actually attaching them to the axle so that when you push it down the road, you're not having to balance it as you know, that, that much. Uh, and then claim three, the load moving device of claim one, one where the, a platform is attached to said rod and said hob, heavy objects are rested on the platform. And then 
we've got a, an even more detailed one where you're attaching uh, a platform to the rod between two discs. You're putting handles on one edge of the platform so you can set things on top of the platform, push it down the road. You basically got a cart. Okay, so now what if someone comes along with a, uh, uh, someone comes along with an automobile? Is it gonna infringe this claim? No, probably not, because it doesn't have handles. The car, the, the, the automobile is not pushed by handles. But how about this claim? Is, is an automobile going to infringe this claim? Sure it is, because it's going to have wheels. It's going to have axles. So you can see that the more, usually the longer the claim, the more limitations there are in the claim and the harder it is to infringe. Now, if somebody was selling carts, this would be the best patent, this best claim to sue under because it would be very clear that they'd be infringing this claim. But if they're selling other kinds of wheeled vehicles, then claim number one would be better. Okay, a chemical, chemical claim. A therapeutic beverage comprising ethyl alcohol. Now, the word comprising is an interesting word in claims because it means including but perhaps also including other things. Uh, so it, it, a, this claim one would cover uh, a shot of grain alcohol. It would, also, uh, it would also cover a gin and tonic because comprising doesn't limit other ingredients. Now, if it said consisting essentially of ethyl alcohol, then it would be limited to the shot of grain alcohol. But that's why you always, almost always see the word comprising in a claim. Dependent chemical claim number two. The beverage of claim one wherein said ethyl alcohol is in a concentration of about 12% by volume in a mixture further comprising water. So again, this might also cover your gin and tonic because you're probably going to get it to about 12% alcohol if you put a shot of liquor in there, and um, the, the tonic is does have water in it, has other things in it as well, but the word comprising allows it to have other things in it. Okay, um, a Marcouche claim. These are kind of fun. Anybody know what this claim is to? A sandwich, yes. A self-contained meal comprising two or more slices of bread. Actually, I realized after I wrote this that uh, a patent attorney would probably say comprising a plurality of slices of bread. <laughs> you wouldn't say two or more. Having, having one or more slices of meat between uh, said bread slices. And the Marcush claims would be claims two and three, where cl claim two Sliced meat is selected from the group consisting of ham, turkey, chicken, roast beef, pastrami, corned beef, and bologna. So to infringe claim two, you would have to have one of those meats in it. If you had, uh, what's not on the, uh, if you had a salami sandwich, claim two would not be infringed. Claim one still would be infringed, but not claim two. Um, the meal... Claim number three, the meal of claim two, further comprising one or more slices of cheese. Again, a Marcush group. The um, um, claim three is also exam an example of a multiply dependent claim in that it's a dependent claim that is based on a dependent claim. You have to pay extra fees for multiply dependent claims, and the fees are outrageous. You usually try to avoid them. A formulation claim. A refreshing therapeutic beverage comprising about 20% ethyl alcohol, about 80% tomato juice, and about 0.05% KM pepper extract. Claim two, the beverage of claim one, further comprising a celery stick. Okay. This would be a formulation claim. And the problem with a formulation claim is, well, what if you used 15% alcohol? Would it, be, would it infringe this claim one? 
Well, that depends on the meaning of the word about. Uh, it brings you back to the question of what the meaning of is is, doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's a very much a lawyer's thing. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I, would, I would doubt that 15% would fall within about 20. But 18% is probably about 20. So a formulation claim can, has a weakness in that if you can stray somewhat from those specific numbers and you can get outside of the about term, then, uh, then it's uh, easy to escape uh, infringement. A method of manufacture. A method of making a refreshing beverage comprising the steps of placing a banana, strawberries, and raspberries into a blender until the blender is half full, filling the blender to the top with ice, placing the lid on the blender and operating at the highest setting until the contents are uniform whereby a refreshing beverage is produced. This would be a method of manufacture claim. If you see somebody walking down the street with a, uh, with a banana, strawberry, raspberry smoothie, are they infringing? Absolutely not, because they're just drinking this beverage. They didn't make, they're, they're not making it. You would have to say, well, where do you get that beverage? Because that beverage was made using a process that infringes my patent. And you would say, well, how do you know? Maybe I didn't use that much ice. Maybe I used half water and half ice. So a method of manufacture claim can be good. But the problem is, you don't know how things are manufactured. And um, unless you can somehow go watch it be made, and if it's a method of manufacturing some complicated machine, and it's manufactured by the Intel company in their big factory out in New Mexico, how are you going to get in there and see how they made that? So method of manufacture claims, although often included in patents, uh, can be difficult to detect who's infringing which again affects the value of your pen. A method of treatment. A method of treating headache, pain in a subject comprising administering by mouth a therapeutically effective amount of acetylsalicylic acid, which is aspirin, whereby said headache, pain is reduced or alleviated. This would be a typical method of treatment claim. If someone <clears throat> has a bottle of aspirin, are they infringing? No. If they take an aspirin, yes, they're infringing. Well, how do you ever, how could that be of any value? Ah, well, there's a company who sells aspirin. And what does it say on the bottle the aspirin is good for? Treating headache pain. And if you sell a bottle of aspirin for the purpose of, of treating headache pain, you are inducing people to infringe this claim. And under the patent laws, one who induces infringement is, is liable as an infringer. And so method of treatment claims can be very valuable. So if you have a method of treating diabetes by uh, administering a therapeutically effective amount of, uh, of a, uh, an inhibitor of a particular enzyme, um, then someone who sells a drug that, that works in that way and encourages people to use it for that particular medical treatment would be infringing that claim. A product by process claim. A sunburn cream made by the process of squeezing the gelatinous material from the leaves of the aloe plant and mixing said material with equal, equal portions of water and ethyl alcohol. And then claim two is a product claim for comparison. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a formulation claim. A sunburn cream comprising about equal portions of aloe gel, water, and ethyl alcohol. Are these claims really pretty much the same? No, they're not. Claim number one is, the courts say, is really a method claim. Unless you use this particular method, um, you will not infringe this claim even if at the end of the day, what you wind up with is the same thing. So if instead of, um, if, if instead of squeezing the gelatinous material out of the aloe leaves, you grind it, then you're not going, then you're not going to be infringing this claim number one. Even though the material that you produce, 
the sunroom cream is going to be identical. Since you made it by a different process, it won't infringe. However, claim number two would be infringed if you wind up with that same mixture. So product by process claims sometimes look valuable, but they're really not the same as a method claim. A gypsum claim is, uh, should be an M, gypsum, is uh, not very often used because it pretty much admits what's already known and simply adds an improvement. And here, it's an improved method of treating headache pain by essentially giving aspirin and co-administering a therapeutically effective amount of caffeine. Uh, you've probably heard of APCs. There's uh, headache pills that do exactly that. Whereas said headache pain is more effectively reduced or alleviated. So what about biotech patents? We've kind of looked at claims. and The idea of claims are important and the wording of the claims can really be important to how whether or not somebody's infringing and whether they're infringing or not really determines what the value of your patent might be. Um, well, composition of matter claims, such as for new, new drugs, antibodies, or vaccines, are still kind of the gold standard for the pharmaceutical industry. If you want to have a very valuable patent, then you really kind of have to come up with a drug or a vaccine or an actual product that a drug company could sell to patients. However, method of treatment claims can be equally valuable, and in many ways, they're somewhat broader because they claim not only a particular molecule, but a whole class of molecules. And method of, so unfortunately, and so uh, the, when you, if you say anybody who has a drug that, when you give it to a patient, inhibits this particular enzyme, and that treats their diabetes, and that's my invention, uh, that could cover many different kinds of drugs, whereas a composition of matter claim might only cover one. And a method of treatment claim can also give you value for known compounds. So when I was at University of Virginia, we had a patent on a method of treating um, supraventricular tachycardia, which is a very life-threatening uh, heart uh, problem where your heart just quivers by essentially taking a syringe and injecting right into the heart a shot of adenosine. Well, adenosine has been known for 30 years. So you couldn't get a patent on the drug adenosine, but we had a patent on a method of treating supraventricular tachycardia comprising administering a therapeutically effective amount of adenosine directly into the heart and turned out to be a very valuable patent, and it also turned out to save millions of lives. And It's something that's on in every uh, ambulance in the country and in every crash cart in every hospital because it saves lives. And the reason that it ever got approved as a drug is because we were able to get a patent on it as a method of treatment claim and because the company that got it approved by the FDA, could sell it and say, use this bottle of adenosine to treat SVT by injecting it into the heart, and they were the only company who could say that, then they could sell that product profitably, and that justified the expense of getting it approved by the FDA. So don't give up on known compounds if you have any use for them. In fact, there's a whole new field of uh, uh, commercial activity in uh, biopharmaceuticals called repositioning of drugs, where people are saying, let's take a look at what drugs are already known, and let's figure out what else you could do with them, because drugs that are already approved by the FDA, you don't have to go through all that safety and stuff. All you got to do is a very small trial to show that it works for this new purpose. And um, there are also some companies that are giving, there's one company, I can't remember, John, do you remember who it is? There's one company that has given a major grant to a university to uh, look for new uses for all of the drugs that they currently sell. Uh, can be very valuable, method of treatment claims. Method of screening claims. Um, a method of screening claim, you say, well, I, I've discovered that um, this, uh, I now have discovered how this particular pathway works. 
And I know that if you could block this particular um, gene, that you could prevent cancer. And so you could, I have a method of screening for drugs that can prevent cancer by running this assay and just go through a million different drugs and you're going to find one that's going to uh, be able to uh, uh, prevent cancer. The problem is it's going to take you probably five years to get your patent on that. And until you get your patent, you can't stop anybody from using your method of screening. And your method of screening is going to get published in your patent 18 months after you file your application. So that means by the time you get your patent, all of the drug companies in the world will have had three and a half years to use your invention to their delight, screening for drugs that would do exactly what you uh, were hoping uh, that you would be able to do. And whatever they discover, they discover a new drug, their new drug is not going to infringe your method of screening claim because that screening is over by the time your patent issues. And so you don't make any money. They make all the money. Maybe you've added some value to the world, but it hasn't added any value to the, the institute or your own pocketbook. So is there any point in filing those types of patents? That's a very good question. Um, I would say very often not. Very often not. Unless, unless you feel that you have Sometimes if you have a particular cell line that you need to use, or there's a particular antibody that you need to use, or something tangible that you've got to have in order to carry that assay out, then you can very often get companies to pay you to use that particular material. But whether or not a patent adds anything to that is, I think, a, a tough question. It probably doesn't. Okay, well, what do patent claims look like in biotechnology? Well, you might claim a polypeptide comprising sequence ID number one. And then the sequence ID might be, uh, this, this is a single letter code uh, for amino acids. Uh, and uh, you could have, nowadays, when you file any patent applications that have protein or gene sequences in them, you have to file sequence listings electronically so that they can do electronic searches to check for novelty and obviousness um, by using the power of computers. But you can certainly get claims to polypeptides and, and DNA sequences provided that you meet all of the other requirements of the law. Claim number two, a compound comprising the structure corresponding to formula two. Formula two. A, X1, X2, and B. And then you're going to probably have a, a bunch of Marcos groups, wherein A is selected from the group of ethyl, methyl, propyl, butyl, pentyl, uh, where X1 is chlorine, fluorine, bromine, or iodine, where X2 is, and, and on and on. And so you can see by having these for a formula, and then having Marcos groups for each one of the individual variables here, you could have a claim that covers a whole bunch of different compounds that have only very general commonalities in their structure. And of course, then the examiner is going to argue with you that your claim is too broad, and um, you'll have that argument, and ultimately you may end up having to trim your Marcos groups down to a narrower range of compounds. A biotech method of treatment claim. A method of treating liver fibrosis in a subject comprising administering a therapeutically effective amount of a vitamin D receptor agonist to a subject having liver fibro fibrosis, thereby treating the fibrosis. So this is a good example of why method of treatment claims can be valuable. It just has to be a vitamin D receptor agonist. Now, in this, this actually did come from a patent. In this particular patent, there was a list of vitamin D receptor agonists in a Marrakesh group in a dependent claim. But note that this claim covers vitamin D receptor agonists that haven't even been discovered yet. So if you get a patent that has this claim, and then uh, 
the big drug companies go out and I say, wow, this is a great idea, and they come up with some really exotic new vitamin D receptor agonists that work really well in treating liver fibrosis, guess who they're going to have to come and talk to? They're going to have to come and get a license to this patent because they can't sell their new vitamin D receptor agonist for treating liver fibrosis without inducing infringement of this claim for which they will be liable as an infringer. Method of screening claim. A method of screening test compounds to determine whether such compounds are therapeutically effective in treating asthma, said method comprising, determining if the inhalation of such compounds decreases acidity in the lung tissue. But as I pointed out, nothing's going to stop a company from screening millions of compounds using this little assay um, before your patent issues. And once your patent issues, they won't need you anymore. So it's hard to get value from that. Which brings us to the $64,000 question, what does it take to go up the value chain here? You know, the screening claims aren't really very valuable. Method of treatment claims certainly are valuable, and claims to particular compositions of matter are extremely valuable, assuming you have ones that are extremely potent and non-toxic and all those good things. So the way to go up the value chain is, uh, first of all, think about the treatment problem. Think about the therapeutic challenge. Think about, I've discovered this new pathway. And yes, I could use this, what I know now, to screen for things. But if I was going to do the screening for myself, or I was going to go that next step, instead of saying, well, we'll leave it to pharma, the pharmaceutical industry to figure this out, what can I do? I know more about this system than anybody. What can I, what can I conjure up in my mind might work? There might be some nonspecific drugs you could try. Hey, well, I don't have any fancy drugs that will inhibit that enzyme, but heck, I, I can get an antibody to it. I know a guy who's got a monoclonal antibody. I'll get some of that. Or uh, some siRNA. I'll shut that gene down, and, and I can prove it that way. Uh, or um, think about anything that you can do to perturb that system in a way that will illustrate the therapeutic potential beyond just saying, well, if you screen a million compounds using my assay, you might find something. Now, if screening is the only way you can go, you can consider applying for an NIH screening grant. There are now seven federally funded high throughput drug screening programs in the US, and NIH has special grants for these. Uh, everybody complains how slow it is to get these grants, um, but if you get the grant, basically the NIH pays to do high throughput drug screening on your uh, model system. And uh, the, there's a panel of the seven academic institutions that have these centers, the Burnham being one, uh, who get together and decide who has the best collection of uh, compounds for that particular target and uh, decides who's going to actually carry out the project. But the nice thing about having one of these academic centers do your drug screening rather than letting the pharmaceutical industry do it for you is that these academic centers will enter into a revenue sharing agreement with the Salk Institute for money they make on the drug they discover, whereas you can't get industry to do that anymore. It used to be that you could, but nowadays if, drug, if industry screens against your target or your model system and they find a drug, then they're not going to pay you a royalty for it. Very neat case, uh, Barbie Burroughs Welcome. Um, you may, some of you may be old enough to remember when uh, the AIDS e epidemic began. And um, it was discovered that HIV was uh, a retrovirus. Burroughs Welcome realized that they had a whole bunch of antiretroviral compounds that they had developed for treating feline leukemia virus. So they got those out and they, they packed them up and they sent them off to NIH because NIH at the time had the only live uh, HIV um, screening assay. And they asked them to test them and see if any of these were good for, for uh, killing uh, the virus. And they came back and they said, yeah, this, this one, it was compound S, 
uh, was pretty good. Well, that turned out to be AZT. Bar Laboratories was a generic drug company. And at the time, Burroughs Welcome came out with AZT as a drug for treating AIDS. It was extremely expensive. And there was a huge outcry that Burroughs Welcome was profiteering off the backs of dying people. And so Bar Laboratories came up with a clever idea. They went to NIH and they said, you know, since the people at NIH did the screening that proved that AZT was effective in treating, in uh, combating HIV, so we think that the scientists at, at NIH should have been named as inventors on that patent. And so they said, NIH, if you'll give us a license to whatever rights you may have in this patent, we'll sue Burroughs Welcome and get the court to, to change the inventorship and name the NIH as a co-owner of that patent, and then we'll go make and sell AZT in competition with Burroughs Welcome and bring the price down, which is exactly what they did. It was a huge trial. and. Uh, Bar Laboratories put their case on, and the judge stopped the trial in the middle, and he said, Bar, there's no way you can win this case. They said, when Burr's Welcome reached into the chemical closet, reached up blindly and said, picked up a bottle and said, I think this can be used to treat AIDS. I said, the inventing was complete. The, con the fully formed concept of using that particular chemical to treat that particular disease was complete in the inventor's mind, and there was no more inventing to be done. The only question was whether the inventor's invention was operable. And when NIH tested to see whether the invention was operable or not, they were merely acting as a pair of hands. They were not cre cre contributing creatively to the conception of the invention, and so they weren't inventors. So. And they said, you know, the same thing is true if you select 1,000 or 10,000 compounds, blindly or not, but you say, I'm going to try all of the benzodiazepines and see what they'll do for treating migraine headache. Uh, if any of them work, then you've invented whatever ones work. If they don't work, then your invention's inoperable and it's a nullity under the law. So what does that tell you about how you can increase your participation in the value chain? If somebody's going to screen drugs, screen for drugs against your model system, you want to be the one picking the compounds. So instead of waiting for the pharmaceutical company to come along with their 9 million compounds they're going to screen, go pull out the Aldrich catalog and say, what kind of things might, might work? Let's see. What kind of drugs are known? What can I try? What kind of things could I? Let's just buy. 25 compounds and test them and see if, see if we get any activity. It might point me in a direction. And then you might be able to claim a broad class of compounds. If you found two compounds that were similar, you might be able to do one of those, those chemical claims where you have all those X and Y groups that can make it pretty broad. And then you can go and talk to people about further refinement and identifying a more specific drug. It's a really great case, uh, Kodak v. Polaroid. This was back, you know, when the Polaroid instant cameras came out. They, they were a crushing blow to Kodak's uh, uh, photographic film business. And so Kodak sued Polaroid to try and have the patent on instant cameras declared invalid. And uh, the uh, Kodak lawyer got Edwin Land on the stand, he was the inventor, and I said, Mr. Land, would you please show us your, your first instant photograph that was the basis for your patent? And he held it up, and they said, the lawyer says, Mr. Land, won't you agree that that's just a black square? That's not a photograph. And Land said, no, he said, he said, actually, if you look closely, you can see the edge of the brim of my hat. And the court said, that's enough. It proved the concept. And there's nothing in the patent law that requires you to have a commercially viable embodiment of your invention in order to be awarded a patent for it. So don't worry if your compounds or your methods aren't so great. What's important is demonstrating the principle, demonstrating 
that the concept you had of the invention, the fully formed concept of the invention, is demonstrated by the data that you may have. Now for part two of my talk. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. We're almost done. Uh, we covered a lot of ground, and I know there's a lot of detail here. Uh, you can um, download the slides from our website if you'd like to look through and, and think about these a little further. If you take a look at some of my uh, uh, some of my mostly food and beverage claims, uh, you think about what might or might not infringe those claims. It gives you some idea of what this claiming business is all about and also helps you to think more broadly about what you might be inventing. Um, the take-home lessons really are that the claims are the key to patent value. And if you want to have greater, more valuable patents, then you have to think in terms of what could the claims of my patent be? What kind of claims will I be able to get? Compound or composition of matter claims are generally stronger than method of treatment claims, which are indeed much stronger than method of screening claims, which I think are of limited value. Even poor drug candidates can support strong claims for drug compounds and for method of treatment. Don't get hung up on perfection. It just has to work a little bit. And also keep in mind that we are very glad, to, the Office of Technology Development is very glad to help you think through the value proposition and help you think about what you might do to do that one extra days, of days worth of experiments that might actually move you a little bit up the value chain and make a difference for you in the Institute. So I hope you'll uh, please come enjoy lunch. And uh, I hope you'll come back and talk more, hear us uh, talk more about patents. Uh, there's a great deal more information that we can provide. We're also happy to hear what you have to say about, uh, about these talks, uh, hear what you have to say about our program and anything that you think that we can do to help you to be better and more prolific inventors. Thank you. <laughs>